Welcome back to Introduction to Agroecology. This is Unit 6. Um, it's going to be split into two parts. The first part, we're going to talk about environmental factors. The first part is going to have to do with light, and the second part is going to have to do with temperature. This slide is showing you the different uh, lights, the different types of light uh, that are out there in the electromagnetic spectrum and for the different waves and how it travels through the atmosphere. And basically, we're going to be looking at um, not everything, because it isn't so necessary for what we're doing, but what it's showing is the different things that we can see as um, for being able to see it. And there's some that's visible. Basically, what's important here is there are some that are invisible as they're large, when they're larger on the left-hand side of the spectrum. And then on the right-hand side of the spectrum, you really don't see them, but some of them are the more um, dangerous um, things within the electronic spectrum. The best ways to get into talking about the different types, and we'll start right now. Light is the primary source of energy for everything in the ecosystem. It has a place to determine our weather patterns. It affects the rainfall we get. Um, it transforms that energy into heat from that. It alters the temperature surface. The light that's coming through is going to change what the temperature is. It's going to help uh, with the wind patterns and how high the winds are. And it's also going to affect the uh, humidity levels of our weather. The different lights, some of them are the light is absorbed into the plants. Sometimes there, it's absorbed into clouds. And then some is actually uh, absorbed into the soil. And as this light comes down from the sun, uh, some of that is directly reflected back up into the atmosphere when it hits the clouds. Not everything. Some of it will go through the clouds depending on the type of light it is. Um, some of it actually comes down to earth. When it comes down to earth, that's what warms up the soil but some of that actually reflects off of the soil and back up into the atmosphere where some of it will hit the clouds if you have a cloudy day and then come back to earth and it'll keep going back and forth, but some will go back through the clouds back up into the higher portions of the atmosphere. Um, the sources of light that we're going to worry about is UV light, ultraviolet light. There's x-rays and gamma rays. Um, those are what's actually the rays that are used when you have x-rays. Um, those are kind of dangerous. Um, then there's infrared and there's radio waves. Um, some of these, of course, you can't see on the spectrum. Uh, UV light, uh, it's not seen by the naked eye. It's in some of the chemical reactions that happen in plants, the light, <clears throat> the UV light is what makes that reaction happen. Uh, it actually is what helps um, the plant pigments form um, from that visible light. Here's an example of, you can see an area where there's ozone depletion. And what basically what that is, I'll explain in further slides, but it's basically a hole in the atmosphere. And the ozone is responsible to help protect us from those ultraviolet lights. Um, the ultraviolet light, only about 1% of it coming from the sun gets past that ozone. Uh, the rest is absor absorbed in that ozone layer and kept in that area. Excessive exposure to ultraviolet light is what we have if you go down to uh, the south. Uh, during the winter time, well, in summertime it's even worse, but if, when we come from, like, say, the Midwest and go down to Florida uh, for spring break or for a vacation, uh, we get burned from the sun because we're closer to the equator, the sun's hotter, and uh, those lights will, you know, will burn us if we get too much exposure to it. Um, some of the other, if you get too much UV exposure, you can get cancer, or you can actually have mutations of cells because they get all messed up with the cancer and, and become, you know, real dangerous and potentially kill uh, humans or animals too. Um, in in terms of this ultraviolet light, the ozone depletion that we have. Um, we have to, we are doing things to try to reverse what's happening so we don't have as much of a problem. Another source of UV lights are from tanning beds. And a lot of people that go to the tanning beds have issues with skin cancer later because they spent too much time in the tanning bed. Um, 
reason we have ozone depletion, why that hole is happening in the atmosphere, is that we have produced something called chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs is what most commonly referred to because chlorofluorocarbons is too hard to say. But basically, the refrigerants that we have in our refrigerators, our freezers, the air conditioners in our house, the air conditioners in our car, um, all of the spray can propellants, so all of our um, spray paints that we use, um, uses um, chlorofluorocarbons and their CFCs in, or, in order to create that propellant. In other words, that's how you spray it. Um, they also use it in making plastic foam. Um, and what they found, uh, they used to use it a long time ago. Um, some of you may remember that our deodorant used to have, uh, you'd shake the can and you'd spray it, just like you do a paint can, and uh, put your deodorant on. Um, but those CFCs basically have gone up and they're destroying the ozone layer, the, the gases that have leaked, especially for the refrigerants, because there's been a ton more of that than there was on the others. Um, but that whole um, is allowing more of that UV light to come into the atmosphere. We want to try to keep that from happening. In order to do that, there was a meeting that they held back in 1987, and it was called the um, it is called the Montreal Protocol, and that basically it's a ban or to phase out and remove any of those substances or products that's causing the CFC issues for the ozone depletion. It was signed by most countries in the nation. Uh, it seems currently that the depletion of the ozone layer is leveled off. Um, there has been a 16, 6 to 14% increase in UV irradiation. In other words, it's decreased by that amount since the early 80s. So that's a good thing, where it actually seems like the ozone uh, hole is getting smaller and smaller as time goes on. And if we keep working on it, that's going to be a good thing. Um, things that affect light or things of qualities of light that will affect how it's going to help plants grow is the quality that you have. In other words, the relative amounts that you have, is it full sun, is it part sun, those types of things. Um, intensity, how hot is it, okay? That's going to vary by what time of year it's happening, in other words, how long the sun shines each day and how many hours of sunlight and then the time of the year that it happens. Um, some points listed here for the different intensities. There's a saturation point, which is when it's too intense and too much sun reaches a plant. Uh, a compensation point when it's not enough. And then in between is the point at which photosynthesis is going to happen in the best manner. Um, <clears throat> Variation determinants, the season of the year, the altitude, and the altitude is how high. The latitude is where it is from the equator. Is it above or below the equator? The topography, in other words, is the land flat? Is it hilly, uh, sloped? Um, that will affect um, how the light varies in an area. The air quality, in other words, if you have smog, not as much uh, su uh, sun is going to reach the surface, so that could affect it. And then also vegetative cover, in other words, if you have a forest, not as much sun is going to get to the ground in a forest than it is in a, an open area where they have uh, farm crops. Um, looking at each one of the individual variations for seasonality, um, during the summer season, it has the uh, longest number of daylight hours, and we're all aware of that, but that means the plants are going to grow better because it has more sun, and that's when an area is going to grow uh, the sun, but the summer season is going to vary from one side of the globe to the other. When it's summer for one side, it is winter for the other, and vice versa on each side of the globe. Um, the winter season, as we know, uh, has the shortest number of daylight hours, when you're at the equator, it has the same number of hours of sunlight year-round, so there isn't a change. Um, <clears throat> for the summer season, sunlight and it's more intense than during the winter season, and that's because it's on an axis, and it is more above head during the summer, and it's off to one side, depending on what side of the uh, earth you're on, for the rest of the year. So in other words, it's farther away, it's not going to be as intense. And here's an example for altitude. 
on the higher elevations um, that have more intense light, the atmosphere is thinner and that's what allows the light to reach more. In other words, if you're out in Colorado, a plant's going to grow differently than it would in other parts of the U.S. because you're up in the mountains <clears throat> and you're higher and it's thinner so the sunlight can get through faster. And here's just some examples of in the different uh, areas and the elevation is uh, what you can see the difference in how full those flowers are in the plants. Uh, here is a light variation, in other words, when in the season. Early in the season, you see on the left picture, it's pretty full, um, and it's not real colorful. In the middle one, in the mid-season, you see it's getting a lot of sun and, and how uh, nice it looks. And then late again in the season, you can see it's starting to lose uh, what it looks like. Um, for light variation, another determinant is the latitude. In other words, you have the, the poles you're at and the equator. Um, so where you're at relative to where the equator is, um, for both of the poles, the North Pole and the South Pole, um, they have a summer season that has 24 hours of daylight and a winter season that's 24 hours of darkness. So could you imagine, if you weren't aware of this happening, living up in one of those areas and you'd never, be able, you'd never want to go to sleep in the summertime because the sun's always up, and in the wintertime it's always dark so you probably never want to get out of bed go to work. Um, at the equator, some of the things that latitude helps with is you can have multiple crop seasons. In other words, you could have two seasons or three seasons, however long, depending on what you're growing. Let's say corn is um, 75 to 80 days, let's just say, for example. So you could do three crops without a problem um, at the equator because you have that warmth and that sun all the time. Whereas in the Midwest, you couldn't, and it gets cold too. Um, they are starting to use in those areas perennial crops. Perennial crops are crops that you put in and they'll always grow, but it allows for multiple yearly harvests because it's always growing. Um, topography, that's the slope of the land, whether it's flat or not. Um, it creates huge changes in the intensity and the length of the light because if you have a big mountain there, it might take a while for it to come over the mountain from the east and for it to get sun on the other side or vice versa. It only has it up to a certain time on the other side of the mountain. Um, the direction and steepness of the slope have the greatest impact. In other words, if you are on the west side of the mountain or the east side, you're going to have more of an effect than if you were north or south for what your mountain was, where it was located, I should say. And winter season also has the largest change because the sun's going to be lower than it would be during the summer months, so you might not get much direct sunlight at all in certain areas. Um, smaller plants are going to be more impacted um, by these changes than the larger ones would, which would be closer to the sun. Uh, we also mentioned air quality. It, when there's article or particles in the air, such as dust, smoke, Pollutants are a big reason for it, carbon monoxide. Um, there's some pollutants that are natural, but there's some that are uh, human created. Uh, the pollutants have the largest impact in urban and industrialized areas. So the factories that have the smokestacks that are pumping out the, the different particles of pollution or cars, the carbon monoxide, um, there's certainly more cars in an urban area, so you're going to have more of an effect of a, there you have more of a potential to have a light variation effect because of it. Um, you can also have a soil disturbance and it can burn or have a large impact um, in rural agriculture areas. So in other words, uh, you have more of an issue having to worry about that um, pollution that's there uh, in agricultural areas. The vegetation cover, that's that tree cover I talked about. The um, more trees there are, the, the thicker the forest, of course, the less light that's going to reach through that. But then that will depend on the type of forest, too, because if you have a deciduous forest, in other words, the leaves fall off in the fall, then you're going to have sun in the uh, winter months when those leaves aren't on the tree anymore. If there's overlapping leaves, it will disperse more of the light, depending on the type of tree it is. 
uh, the plants will also re react differently based on the type of cover that's there. In other words, what's underneath of those trees will grow differently based on the type of tree that's there if you put the same plant in different areas. Uh, forest, forest coverage usually has the largest impact on plants compared to agriculture fields. And the reason uh, for that is, is on the agriculture fields, the corn or the beans or wheat or hay that's growing out there isn't going to cover as much of that ground as a tree would. So in other words, the, the more light's going to get to more of the plant. Uh, the variety of crops you plant would certainly have a different and can't be covered too. Um, uses of the light energy, what do you need it for? You need it for germination, in other words, for that seed to start growing so you can have your plant. It needs it to establish that plant for those uh, carbon dioxide to be converted into sugars through photosynthesis so that you can establish that plant. Uh, and then once that happens for the nutrients to come up through the roots and have your uh, plant growth, and then once you get to the point of that, having the right amount of those nutrients so that you can create a harvestable food. In other words, you're going to have an ear of corn that's large enough. You're going to have a uh, a piece of wheat that has enough wheat on it so that you can harvest it. And then there could be some other variations that would be affected by that light energy. Um, for germination, for the detail of it, it's needed. If you don't, most seeds aren't going to germinate at all. Some seeds, when you plant them, um, they do vary. The amount that you need varies by the seed. Uh, that you have. There are some seeds that like to be on top of the soil. There are some seeds that like to be in the soil in various depths in order to be able to germinate. There are some seeds that if they don't have complete darkness, they won't germinate. But you also have to have the soil and the moisture to have that happen too. So it's just not complete darkness that makes the seed germinate. For plant establishment, um, the sunlight the amount of sunlight can affect the sprouted seed leaf from establishing. In other words, if you aren't getting enough sunlight, it's not going to think it should <clears throat> uh, want to start growing and become a, you know, a plant that you can put out in the ground somewhere. Uh, the establishment can be enhanced or deterred based on the amount of sunlight. That, of course, too depends on the type of plant. Um, some plants like more sun than others in order to be able to grow. And then uh, canopy cover can also affect plant establishment. So if it's in a forested area or in an area that you have a screen, even if it's something artificial like a hoop house or a greenhouse where you can put screens over it or put whitewash on the greenhouse, it certainly could affect uh, whether or not that plant will establish based on the amount of sunlight it's getting. For plant growth, um, the canopy cover uh, for one plant could create natural competition between plants. In other words, if you have one plant that's growing faster than others, it might not allow as much sun, it won't allow enough sun to get down to those other plants. So it could, a plant that's growing slower might not ever grow to its full potential because the other plant is taking up more of that sun. In other words, it's competing for that uh, sunlight for the photosynthesis to happen. Um, plants sometimes can adapt when they're competing uh, and they'll allow energy from sun to go to other parts of the plant that are shaded. Uh, it depends on the, the plant that you have. The leaf shape and size uh, in a plant also certainly can help or affect whether or not a plant will adapt to the different exposure levels. Um, the plant production of harvestable food it's the ability to use a, that light energy to increase the amount you can take from it, like I said earlier. Um, they are just starting to learn about this, so in order to fully understand the process, we have to do more studies in order to fully take advantage of, hey, what differences in light, what effect do they have on how much corn you're going to get, say. Uh, it also involves putting more energy into that carbon partitioning, and that carbon partitioning is what, how it uses the different parts of that sh the sugars that it creates in, in a plant to its best use. Uh, other variations, the uh, miscellaneous category, uh, grow, growth to 
or away from the sunlight. In other words, it can really make a difference where you place the plant uh, for, for the energy and you aren't going to get as much in some areas as others. Um, but you can adapt that amount and if they do, it's going to change the flowering period, how the seed germinates, when the leaf drops. So if it's not getting as much sun, it's probably not going to grow as long, so it's going to think it's time to start losing its leaves. And then you'll also get the leaf coloration changes that happen around when that leaf drop is going to occur. Um, how do you best manage the light energy? Well, the best thing is to choose the right crops for your area. If you don't choose the right crops, you aren't going to get the type of harvest that you want. Uh, allowing for crop diversity could help mixing different crops together and then making sure you don't have a plant canopy that is going to keep your plants from growing properly. So that's just picking the right plants. Um, the best crops for the region, uh, some like high intensity light, a lot of light for a long time to get the best harvest. Um, some plants like less. So you might be able to figure out a combination of plants where you have one kind of partially cover another area um, and, and that helps the process or you grow them in an area that you don't get as much sunlight. Um, and some like more moist locations or moisture locations to get a better crop and some they'll produce a good crop if you get moisture at the right time. Uh, it allows for crop diversity. You're utilizing areas of the ecosystem for the appropriate crop. So in other words, if you have a place that has altered sunlight, let's say that the, you're, you're near a forested area and it doesn't have as much sunlight, you could plant a crop there that doesn't need as much sun, okay? So they can plant them under. Not so much in a normal farming area, but in areas that graze crops such as cocoa, vanilla, coffee, they can be planted underneath tree cover. They're finding out they can be planted under tree canopies and still grow properly for them. So we're learning to, you know, use areas that we haven't in the past. And then um, in crop mixtures, uh, this is a relatively new thing. Um, probably not going to happen on a huge wide scale, but in your home environment especially, or perhaps in an organic environment where you're going to maybe have more hands picking than you would automated picking, they are planting corn and then underneath the corn they're going to plant beans or squash and those are viney plants that would grow up and then you can pick them off the corn and you can still get the corn. It's not going to take away and they'll both grow, they both get enough sunlight and uh, we can start seeing some of that to more uh, better utilize the land that we have. Um, choosing the best regions. Um, in terms of doing that, the, the intensity and how much you have, like we had mentioned in a prior slide, and then the moisture lo locations are good, and that allows for a crop diversity and providing for the right canopy for the plants that you're putting in there. So it's important when you're trying to manage that <coughs> to look and see what that plant requires because you could certainly put it in the wrong thing. But as the case with cocoa or vanilla or coffee, you're seeing that they are able to use uh, areas that they didn't use in the past. Here's just an example of how the light comes through. And you can see how it's kind of dappled and filtered coming through. Certainly it's coming through. But you have all those big trees um, out there that are going to keep the amount of sun from coming in uh, from being as intense. Uh, for the future, um, they have to look at some of the things, some of the areas they're looking at is carbon partitioning, uh, photosynthetic pathways, um, trying to raise the yield um, as much as using organic material as possible in a soil. In other words, trying to get it better, returning it. Um, that organic material, not taking everything, but putting more back in. Corn's a perfect example of one they're trying to do that with because it takes so much of the um, good nutrients out of the soil. And then using uh, more of that sun energy in different ways in an agroecosystem, trying to uh, store some of that energy to use later. And here are the attributions. 